Yeah, so today we are pleased to have Professor Yonina Yelda from uh, Weisman Institute. Uh, she's a professor of mathematics and computer science at Weisman. And she also heads the Center for Bio Biomedical Engineering and Signal Processing. She's also a visiting professor at MIT and she was a visiting professor at Stanford before. So we are very pleased to have her. Please welcome her. And um, Yonina, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, great. So thank you so much for the kind introduction. And it's really a huge pleasure to be here. I've, uh, we were talking about it earlier. I've been enjoying my visit here so much. And it's just amazing to see this uh, university and institution. It's really not like anything I've seen before in the most positive way. So thanks for hosting me and thanks for arranging the entire visit. It's, it's, it's really been an enormous pleasure to get to know everyone here better. And I look forward to many collaborations. So with that, let me begin and let me say at the outset that if there's anything uh, both for the people in the room and for the people listening online that looks interesting to anyone, I'm really, really, really happy to, to initiate collaborations here. So anyone that finds anything interesting, you know, please feel free either during the talk or, or after or by email uh, to, to be in touch. So what I want to talk about today are some ideas that we and of course many others have been working on with the goal of seeing how we could combine AI ideas that of course you know, in a, in a place like this needs no introduction with model-based methods that we're used to more traditionally from, you know, signal processing, computer vision. So the question is, you know, could we take the best of both worlds and combine them? So, you know, we know, of course, today that deep learning is everywhere. Again, we definitely don't need to motivate that here. But the places that deep learning has been particular successful are places that are very hard to model with conventional methods. So, you know, computer vision, speech processing, these are problems that were traditionally always difficult to tackle with standard optimization methods. But of course, you know, this comes with a price, right? So we know that we could do amazing things with AI. We could, you know, spawn faces if we wanted to. Not that I'm sure there's a good reason to do that, but we could if we wanted to. We could come up with the classification algorithms that are better than human uh, classification methods. And really, there's many examples of the huge success of deep learning and AI. But it, of course, does come with a price. So first of all, we typically need very large training sets in order to get good performance. We know that the methods are typically not interpretable, so we get a result, but we don't necessarily understand it. And I'm sure I know there's many students here. I'm sure students have experienced this a lot, where you, know, you try to run something, it doesn't work, and then you kind of stir it a little bit more, play around with the parameters, and then all of a sudden it does work, but we don't necessarily understand you know, why it does work or why it didn't work before. Um, the, the computational cost could be very high. So we tend to say that AI is fast or cheap, but that's only after you've trained the method. Um, of course, there's many, many issues of robustness, generalization. The complexity could be huge. So this is an example of, you know, GPT-23, one of the most successful networks in uh, human text translation, <clears throat> uses 175 billion parameters. Okay, so that's really a huge amount. And when we think of examples that are more, um, you know, I would say signal processing based, so communication, radar, et cetera, it just doesn't make sense to have so many parameters. So, you know, the question is if we can do better than that. Now, if we pause for a second and look at what people used to do before AI, so, you know, let's say five years ago, you were a student for signal processing, then the standard thing to do in signal processing and communication is to start with a model, right? So uh, most processing is based on modeling, the nice thing about modeling is that you can incorporate everything you know about the problem. So it could be domain knowledge, it could be structure, whatever you know, you could, you could typically incorporate into the optimization problem. Typically, you could get inference from, you know, small amounts of data. And also, there's really nice tools to analyze how good your solution is. So not only is it easy to get a solution, but typically you could say something about how good the solution is. So these are some of the advantages of more standard techniques, but of course they rely on a model, which is an advantage and a disadvantage because you might not always have a very good model of your problem. And also the inference could be slow. So even in problems when you have a model, the model could be very complicated and therefore might not be easy to actually get a solution. So what we wanna talk about in this talk today is how we may be able to combine the two. So we wanna be able to combine model-based methods with deep learning methods with the hope that by combining them, we could get efficient methods, interpretable methods, and they should be simple to train, okay? So we don't wanna have uh, very large training sets. 
So let's look at a minute for some motivation, right? Why, why do we want to get these methods? So one nice area that we've been uh, working in where I think is, is uh, nicely motivated in this context is standard communication problems, like symbol detection. So, you know, that's probably the most basic task of a communication receiver. We have a transmitter. It sends information to a receiver, and we want to be able to detect um, that information. So it's a very simple classic problem. And typically, we'll have some channel. Okay, and channel could be complicated. Like, let's say we have uh, a minor channel, so there could be multiple reflections. When we send the symbol S, we're going to receive Y. But Y could already be some complicated version of S um, because of the channel. Now, there's, of course, many, many, many established methods for symbol detection. And most of these, which of course we use in our phones all the time, they're based on very simple models. So, you know, the simplest model is to assume that the input output relation is just a simple linear Gaussian model. And as simple as it is, many methods are based on this that we actually use in practice. So even though it's a very simple model, it actually works um, quite well in practice. So once we assume that we have a linear Gaussian model, we could go ahead and come up with, for example, you know, a maximum a posteriori receiver or a maximum likelihood receiver, depending on whether or not we have a prior, and get the optimal solution. So based on the model, we could find the optimal solution, but we have to remember that when we say optimal, it of course depends on the underlying model that we chose. So on the one hand, this is very simple, okay? And therefore, it may not necessarily reflect the environment that we're actually in. It also assumes that certain things are known. So in this case, we're assuming that the channel is known, the channel is embedded, in this matrix A. So, oh, okay, I don't think the point is working, but anyway, in the matrix A, we're basically embedded, embedding the channel. Now, if we don't know the channel exactly, then the performance may not be so good in practice. So this is good for simple channels, and indeed, these methods are used today in cell phones. But if we start thinking about sixth generation, where we have you know, IoT devices, many different devices that are communicated in, in, in short range channels that change very rapidly, then this type of system is no longer going to be practical. We can't assume that we can continuously estimate the channels and use them in our receiver. So, you know, this is, this is some uh, motivation to why we may want to use deep learning. And in particular, like I said, we want to remove this channel model dependency. Okay, so instead of having a standard receiver like we had before that is optimal in some sense, we might use a deep network as our receiver. So there's been, you know, probably by now tens or even hundreds of papers that looked at that. So just replacing, let's say the Viterbi detector by a deep network that will perform the symbol detection for you. But in general, this requires very large training sets. Now, in principle, you could say, well, that's fine. You know, we could simulate a communication channel and generate as much training data as we want, but the training data will depend heavily on the channel condition. So if you change a SNR, or if the channel changes, then the network is no longer going to work. And again, if we're thinking of networks that are highly parameterized, that are changing very rapidly with time, this is not going to be practical. And actually, there's many examples of networks in the literature that you know we've tried and other people have tried um, to recreate them, right? You look at results in papers, and obviously the results are correct, right? But they're correct for very, very particular channel conditions. And if you try to use the network, even with a slightly different SNR, then all of a sudden the results are very, very poor. Okay, so the, the difference in performance could be very, very dramatic. So that's not gonna be very useful for, for channels that change um, very rapidly. The, the other issue is that we know that under known conditions, we have optimal approaching algorithms. So, you know, ideally we'd like to have a method that doesn't need a lot of training data and when things are known or when channel conditions don't change, we actually are optimal. Okay, so we'd like to have something that approaches the optimal performance that doesn't want to doesn't require a lot of training data. So we'll see later on in the talk. One of the methods that we've worked on is what we call VTurbiNet. It's basically a network version of the VTurbi decoder, and it's model based. Okay, so this is an example of how we start from a model and use that to develop a deep network. But just to motivate um, the rest of the talk, you could already see the performance that we could get. So we basically use a model based approach and incorporate that into the known Viterbi network, it allows us to do symbol detection very efficiently without requiring additional training data. In fact, we train only on the header that is there anyway. So essentially from a communication or protocol level, we're not sending any training symbols. We're just using the symbols that are already there. And the nice thing is that it approaches the optimal performance of Viterbi as if we knew the channel. Okay, so these are the types of results that we're aiming for. And what's important to keep in mind that's very, very different 
than let's say, you know, Google or Facebook that are looking at problems where you're training on millions and millions of examples and the, the conditions are kind of static. Here we're looking at examples where we don't have a lot of training data and the conditions change all the time. So we want to be able to do this uh, very rapidly. Okay, so hopefully that gave a little bit of motivation as to why we even want to use model-based deep learning. Okay, so the next question is fine. Let's say hopefully you're convinced that it's good to incorporate models into learning and not make learning just black boxes. But the next question is, how do we do that? So to think about how we would do that, um, let's just take a bird's eye view for a minute on, on signal processing. Okay, so this is kind of very, very uh, abstract version of what signal processing does. So typically in signal processing, you'll have some input that's gonna be your measurement. So let's say it could be a corrupted image. You have the desired output, let's say the clean image. And then you have some known relationship, okay? So again, this is all based on models. So you assume some known relationship between your output, your input Y, your measurement, and your desired output X. So you're gonna assume, for example, that Y is approximately equal to some G of X, okay? You have some known relationship that you're exploiting. And then what you're typically gonna do is try to optimize some metric function. So let's say you might wanna minimize the squared error between Y and GX. So you're gonna search for the X, you're gonna search for the output that makes G of X as close as possible to Y, let's say in some norm sense or any other metric that you want. Okay, now typically that won't have a closed form solution. So in simple cases it does, and in other cases it won't have a closed form solution. And you'll use your favorite iterative solver to solve the problem. So maybe you'll use, let's say gradient descent or projected gradient descent if you have constraints or ADMM or whatever, any iterative algorithm that you want. And typically what an iterative algorithm will end up looking like is something that like illustrated over here. So you'll start with some generic computation. You'll then have the iterations, the green and yellow block that typically if you look at the iterations, part of it will, will just be generic mathematical operations. Part of it will be operations that depend on the model. And then you'll have some output processing and you'll get the result. Okay, so that's kind of a standard way of solving signal processing or communication problems. Now, on the other hand, if you look at deep learning, of course, the scenario is very, very different. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna have a fixed architecture that really has nothing to do with your problem. Okay, so maybe it's a ResNet or a CNN or whatever, your, your favorite um, network, but it's not specifically tailored to your problem. You'll then have many, many input and output pairs, that's the training data, and you'll use those paired inputs and outputs to train the weights in this fixed network. And then when you have a new measurement coming in, you're gonna put it through this train network and hope that magically it's gonna be close to your underlying desired X. Okay, so these are very, very different approaches um, to solving basically the same problem. So how could we combine that? Well, what we're gonna look at in this talk are two methods um, that we've been focusing on in order to combine them. The first is by integrating model-based algorithms into deep networks. So basically we're going to use the iterative algorithm to dictate the architecture of the network. And that's what's called unfolding or unrolling. And then the second method is going to be the reverse where we just integrate a deep network into model-based algorithms. So here we actually start with the method itself and everywhere there's something we don't know, we just use a network to solve that particular block. Okay, so this sounds very abstract. I'll hopefully make it clear in the next few slides. So let's start by um, unfolding or unrolling. So this is a really, really nice idea that dates back to Gregor and Lacoon, a paper from uh, 2010 on, on Lista. And really it kind of lay dormant. So even though it's, it's a beautiful piece of work, um, it, it tailored a very specific problem and somehow it didn't, um, it didn't receive a lot of interest at the time. But in recent years, people have been looking more and more at using unfolding and particularly in our group, uh, we've been expanding this and looking at it quite a bit. So those of you are interested, we have a recent review that we wrote for the Signal Processing Magazine on algorithm unrolling. But let me try to give you the, the basic idea. It's actually quite simple. So we start with the iterative optimization method that we um, illustrated before. And then what we do is we write down explicitly several iterations, let's say 10 iterations of the method. Okay, so let's say 10 gradient steps or projected gradient steps or ADMM steps or whatever. So until now, there's no learning. We're just using a small number of iterations of our iterative algorithm. But then in the last step, what we do is we look at the parameters in this iterative method that depend on things we don't know. So for example, in, in the communication problem, if you do this unfolding, then maybe these layers are gonna depend on the channel, which you don't actually know. And then we free those parameters, meaning those parameters that we don't know, we actually learn from data. So we end up getting an architecture that's not a standard 
resin or CNN or anything known, but rather the architecture itself is coming from the iterative method, but it's not fixed. Whatever we don't know, we're actually learning from training data. Okay, so this is the basic method of um, unfolding, and we'll see more examples of that in the rest of the talk. Now I'm just giving the idea. The second approach that we use is more a plug-in approach. So unfolding is very good for problems where we start from a well-defined optimization method, and then we could easily use unfolding. But there's many algorithms that we use in practice that are not actually directly solving some optimization problem. Like the Viterbi decoder, for those of you familiar with it, is a very good example. It's actually a dynamic programming method for solving maximum likelihood problems over a Markovian chain, okay? So it's, it's hard to trace that back to a very specific optimization problem. It's more a good heuristic that works well in practice. So in those cases, what we want to do is we want to start with the algorithm itself. And instead of replacing the entire algorithm by an end-to-end -end network, which is what people do today, we try to break up the algorithm into blocks and keep everything we don't know in one block. And then if we do that, we just take the block that we don't know and replace only that block by a network. But now the thing is that that network is only one component in the overall flow of the algorithm. So typically it doesn't have to be very deep. We'll see in the Viterbi net, which is exactly what we do over here. We actually use a two layer network. So typically it's quite shallow. That's why it doesn't need a lot of training because it's only solving a very specific problem. It's not solving the end to end problem. Okay, so this is more of a plug in approach for cases where we're not starting from the optimization formulation, but rather we're starting from the actual method. Okay, and again, those of you interested, we have a review on this method um, together with Andrea Goldsmith, who's of course a well-known communication expert, specifically for the context of communication. Okay, so these are kind of the two methods. And in the rest of the talk, we're gonna go into more detail in these two methods. So we'll start by looking at unfolding methods, particularly in imaging, and then we'll look at this plugin approach um, particularly for different communication problems. But before I continue, any questions on the basic idea? Feel free to ask, so. Okay, if anybody wants to ask online, I'm happy to. All right, good, sorry, go ahead. Every equation you're using the same parameters. Okay, no, that's a really good point. So you could, you could tie the parameters, which means that in every method, I could, I could tie the parameters and then learn learn them once and keep them fixed in all, in all iterations and all layers, or I can untie them and basically in each layer, let the parameters vary. So typically we untie them because it actually leads to better performance, unless we're very, very constrained in training data, and then we tie them just so that I don't over-parameterize the problem. But, if, but typically we untie them. That's a really good point. Other questions? All right. So let me continue. So, so let's go back to unfolding and just look at a simple example and then see how we extend it for many different problems. So the original unfolding uh, method was for sparse recovery, but, and we'll show that in the next slide. But in general, like I said, what you do in unfolding is you start with your iterative algorithm. So typically in an iterative algorithm, right, you have your input, it goes through some iteration, and then you have the current iteration XK. And now we just, you know, unfold it. So we write it down. Um, a specific number of times. And then we'll see that these layers depend on parameters that are denoted here by theta. And we assume that theta is actually not known. So we learn them in every layer. So here I'm depicting it as untimed, like theta is different in every layer. But if you're very limited in training data, then you could enforce theta one equal theta two, et cetera. Okay, so this is the basic idea of unfolding in, in the original um, Gregor and Lacoon paper. Actually, they looked at a tied version. Uh, which doesn't work so well in practice, but uh, you know the concept is still there. So they looked at the sparse recovery problem where I have measurements y that equal to some ax plus noise where x is assumed to be sparse. And the standard method to solve these problems is the well-known um, L1 penalized least squares problem. So I look for an x that minimizes the least squares error and is maximally sparse. And if you solve, for example, using the ISTA method, iterate a shrink and then thresholding, which is basically a projected gradient descent, then in each layer, you're going to have a gradient step, which are these two blocks that are coming from the gradient step. And then you have a thresholding step that's coming from the L1 uh, penalty. So this would just be an iterative method. Now what you're going to do is you're going to write this down k times. And the last step, the unfolding step, 
is going to be replacing, first of all, this lambda is going to be learned instead of assuming that it's fixed. And then these two blocks, instead of assuming that they're known, you're going to learn them. You're going to assume that they're arbitrary linear transformations and you're going to learn them. Of course, you can add various different constraints. So there's many problems where let's say we assume that these are convolutional layers, so we don't allow them to be arbitrary. You could tie them in different ways. So there's still a lot of game here, but hopefully this gives the basic underlying idea. In the original paper of Gregor and Lacoon, they actually um, tied them. They, they also were looking at this more as an optimization solver, not so much as a learning method. But today people look at this more as a learning method using the same type of idea. So hopefully the idea is, is understood. And what I want to show now is how we can use this for different imaging problems. So the first problem we looked at, and this is work done together with a group of uh, Professor Vishal Monga, we looked at how we could use this for simple deep learning problems. Now, deep learning is one of the, probably the most well-known studied problems in the literature. There's tons of deep networks that people have developed um, for deep learning. And when we started out, we weren't actually hoping to do better than all of those methods, but actually to do similar using something very simple. What you're going to see is that we actually end up doing better. Okay, so it's a very simple network. Um, no, no tricks and you know all this fancy stuff, and it actually works better than state-of-the-art deep networks. So what did we do to get our unfolding? We started with a very simple idea of just searching for, so in, in the, the blurring problem, you don't know the convolutional filter, right? You don't know the blur, and of course you don't know the input. So we set up a least squares problem where we're trying to look for the, the blur. Okay, K is like the blurring function, and GI are the features of the underlying signal X, which of course we don't know. So we're looking for the features and the blur that will best match the output Y or different transforms of Y, right? Because instead of matching Y, you might want to match the gradient of Y if you're doing total variation, for example, et cetera. And we put a penalty on the features and a penalty on the blur function. Okay, so this is kind of a standard optimization framework to look for the signal X and for the blur kernel. We then solve this problem using a variable splitting approach. Okay, so that's how we develop the network. And then of course, we free the parameters. So the parameters that we free here are these features of Y. So instead of saying in advance, let's say, I'm going to match the gradient of Y, we basically learn which features of Y we should be matching. So we end up with a network that has 10 layers. So it's a very simple network. And what we can show is that it actually does better than state-of-the-art methods. What we're comparing with here are three deep learning networks that are considered to be state-of-the-art. And it's a little bit hard to see on the screen, but if you, if you look at some of these zoom-ins, you could see that we actually do better than these methods, even though our network is very, very simple. Okay, so it's, it's quite powerful in practice. So in everything I've shown until now, we actually assume that we know the regularizer, right? Like in LISTA, we use an L1 penalization. We use an L1 and mixed L1, L2 penalization. So we assume that the regularizer is fixed and we're basically learning parameters of the model. But often you don't actually know what, what is a good regularizer, right? Because a regularizer you could think of as a prior on um, the unknown function X, right? So. Sometimes I have a good guess, like I say, okay, I know X should be sparse, but often I don't know anything about X. So I also want to learn the prior, not only learn the solution. Of course, if I know the prior, I could find <clears throat> the solution. So the way this is typically done in the literature is, for example, using guns, right? So offline, you kind of learn the best prior, and then you plug that in to your deep network. What we suggest to do here is to also unfold the prior. So rather than learning it, in advance and keeping it fixed throughout the network, we allow the parameters of the prior to be unfolded together with the learning of the method itself. So in each layer, now in each layer, we're also learning um, the blocks as we did before, but we're also learning parameters of the prior. And not surprisingly, that actually leads to, to very powerful performance. So this allows us to solve problems that are more difficult than the ones we saw before. So not just the blurring, but also in painting, and uh, many other problems here, we're comparing our approach to both, you know, the original clean version. Um, so this is, this is our approach. This is the original one. This is the corrupted one. And we're also comparing to leading approaches in the literature. And again, you see that even though we're using a simpler network, fewer parameters, we're actually doing better than other methods in the literature. And all of our approaches are very interpretable, right? Because we know what each layer is actually doing. Okay, so this is for kind of different, um, Imaging problems, we can use this for separation problems. So 
One of the areas that we've encountered this is um, in ultrasound. So let me go back so we can see that uh, illustration again. Oh, now it's not playing. Okay, whatever. Anyways, if you saw this before, in, in ultrasound, when you take an image, you're basically getting very strong reflection from the clutter, like the background tissue. But what you're interested in is the blood. Okay, but the thing is that you see it together and the clutter is very, very strong. So the first thing that you want to do before you go ahead and process the blood is separate the tissue from the blood. And the way it's done today is by just using SVD. So you assume that you know, the, the stronger eigenvectors are the reflection of the tissue and the smaller eigenvectors are the blood. But that actually doesn't give such good separation because it doesn't fit so nicely. Um, the, the true image doesn't fit so nicely into the separation. So what we propose to do instead is to use that as a starting point, but to unfold that. So basically we built a model that consists of low rank and sparse. So we assume that the tissue or the clutter is low rank and that the blood or the desired signal is sparse. And that's, you know, that would be solving a robust PCA problem. But then we actually unfolded that um, to get better performance. So to set this up mathematically, we assume that our data could be uh, decomposed into a low rank part and a sparse part. We assume that this is low rank, so we put a penalty on the eigenvalues to make it low rank. We assume that that's sparse, so we put an L1 penalty um, to make sure it's sparse. And then again, you could use your favorite gradient method, so you'll get an iterative um, algorithm. And then in the next step, we unfold it. So again, we free the parameters and learn them from data. And this actually leads to a very powerful method and very good separation. So here you see some examples how we could totally separate the blood from the background tissue by using this approach. And again, it's it's a shallow, I mean, relatively shallow, shallow network, 10 iterations, and it does this uh, separation very effectively. Okay, so we've used this in many other problems of ultrasound, for example, beamforming. So beamforming is a very standard approach in radar or in ultrasound. And typically the weights, so, so beamforming is basically look, you're, you're taking all the data and you're trying to beamform it to create a beam in a particular direction. And usually that's done by weights that are somehow optimized. What we do here is we learn the, the weights in this model-based fashion. And you can see that it gives much better contrast and um, much better resolution, but still being an interpretable uh, lightweight method. We've used this a lot for different COVID problems. So when COVID started, um, we I, I had a biomedical engineering center. So within the center, we have a clinical forum where we meet regularly with doctors. And then when COVID started, of course, it was natural to see you know, where we could kind of help. And what we looked at is trying to get detection from both X-ray and ultrasound, very efficient and fast detection. And here again, we use these model-based methods and we're able to get over 90% um, detection from X-ray and uh, very good detection from ultrasound as well by incorporating models into this detection process. Now, the interesting thing here is that, of course, for COVID, it's not that we had good models, right? But the point is that even if you in input simple features that in this case had nothing to do with COVID because we didn't know anything about COVID, they had to do more with lungs, um, then we were able to improve the performance quite drastically, still using a very simple network. Okay, so that's a little bit of how we can use these ideas for imaging. Uh, what I want to do next to show how we can use these ideas for super resolution, let me just pause and see if there's any questions so far. Can you give examples of some simple features you use? Yeah, so it's actually, it's embarrassing how simple they are and how much it boosts the performance. So for example, in X-ray, what we did is instead of using just the, the input data itself, we also used a segmentation map of the lungs. Okay, now this is nothing to do with COVID. It's just telling the image, you know, here, these are where the lungs are. Now, presumably the network should have been able to do that from the input data. But the fact that we actually gave that as an additional input um, really improved the performance substantially. So that's for X-ray. For ultrasound, we use things like B-line, so indicating kind of the vertical lines that you get. And all of these are things that presumably the network could have learned from the images themselves, but still by explicitly giving that as an input and incorporating it correctly into the method, it actually boosted performance quite a bit. And again, this has to do with the fact that it, there's not a lot of training data. So that helps kind of, um, and these are easy things to input. Okay, so let's move ahead, changing gears, 
and talk about super resolution, which at least to me is a really cool um, topic. So one of the big problems in using microscopy, we've been working in microscopy problems for, for quite some time, is the well-known Abbas diffraction limit, which is a limit of physics, right? It has nothing to do with our hardware. And this limit says that we can't see details that are smaller than half the wavelength that we use for illumination. Okay, now this is like an underlying limitation of physics, independent of how sophisticated our, um, our, our microscope is. And in 2014, the Nobel Prize in chemistry went to this really clever idea of super resolution using fluorescent microscopy, where the idea was that you introduce fluorophores. So if you want to look at a tissue with high resolution, you introduce fluorophores, you control the blinking of these fluorophores so that instead of taking one image, you now take thousands of imaging, images, where in each image, only a small number of fluorophores are actually going to be fluorescing. So if you look at an image and there's only like three green dots, then everywhere there's a dot, you know there's something there, right? So you put a Gaussian everywhere you see a dot. And if you sum over the entire set of images, you'll get a super resolved image. So basically what you're doing here is you're trading off spatial resolution with temporal resolution, because now in to get a single image, you need thousands of exposures. So basically you're assuming that nothing is changing, right? The cell basically has to be dead, okay? It can't be live, but you're getting very good spatial resolution. So what we looked at here is asking ourselves, could we get both good spatial resolution and good temporal resolution? Okay, so the way to do that is to first start, you know, when we do these unfolding methods, we, we first start with like a classical signal processing approach and then learn what we don't know. So the classical approach that we started with was first to say, okay, let's exploit structure in the correlation domain. Why, what structure do I have? Well, first of all, you know, these tissues are gonna be sparse, so I have sparsity, but I also have sparsity if I look in the blinking of these fluorophores, okay? Because they fluoresce in an independent fashion, and therefore, if I look in the correlation domain, I'll have sparsity just from the fact that they're independent. Okay, so basically we could set this up as a sparse recovery problem in the covariance domain. So I'll skip through the technical details, but the point is that because the fluorophores fluoresce independently, if you look at their covariance function, it's gonna be diagonal. So that already introduces a lot of sparsity. And then the diagonal itself is going to be sparse just because the fluorophores are sparsely uh, located within the tissue. So we get kind of this double sparsity. And if you look at the performance, it actually works quite well. So here we're, we're comparing our method, SPARCOM, which stands for Super Resolution Correlation Microscopy, with STORM, that's the method behind the Nobel Prize. And we see that we actually get better resolution than STORM. So here you can see a cavity that you don't actually see in STORM, so we can get better resolution using much fewer frames. So instead of having 12,000 frames, we have, let's say, 300 frames. So two orders of magnitude faster, and we get even better resolution. Okay, so this is super cool, and we could do now very high resolution fast microscopy, but it does assume that we have a good estimate of the PSF, the point spread function of the microscope. Now, in some settings, that's okay. I mean, that's how we got these results. But in other settings, estimating the PSF could be complicated. And therefore, the next natural step is to unfold this method and not require knowledge of the PSF. So basically, we unfold the PSF. Those are the parameters that we learn from data. And if you do that, we get even better performance than we've seen before. So it actually even further increases the resolution. And the nice thing is that all the training here was done from a single input. Okay, so it doesn't require a lot of training data. We're only trying to learn PSF and it improves the performance quite substantially. And the, night, the better thing is that we don't have to know anything. So we can apply this to any image without having to know or estimate the underlying PSF. So it gives a uh, very good resolution in practice. We're really excited now. We're working with a group at Weizmann, Professor Gilad Han, and actually applying this to live cell imaging. So now we could do, you know, very high quality, um, imaging, but also very fast because I don't need many images. And what we're doing now is that we're actually using this to see the um, the involvement of T cell receptors. And Gilad Haran's group has been working, you know, from the chemical biological point of view, they've been working on T cell receptors for quite some time, and they had different hypotheses as to what their behavior should look like, but they never were able to see this in live. Okay, so they did indirect measurements. Now with this method, we can actually do direct measurements. And we're actually writing a paper about this now. So we're, we're kind of uh, excited that this simple idea actually leads to kind of insights into biology that we couldn't get before. 
Okay, so that's kind of on the scientific level or the biological level. The next thing we wanted to do is see if we could apply it to the medical domain, which is another area that we've been working on a lot. And the question we want to answer is whether we can use this to increase resolution in ultrasound. So ultrasound is a very convenient medical imaging modality, but it's limited in its resolution. That's, that's kind of one of its uh, big challenges. So of course now in ultrasound, I can't inject fluorophores into the body or I don't want to inject fluorophores into the body. But what we can do instead is use these contrast agents. So this, for example, is Sotopu. It's a type of uh, contrast agent that you could just inject with infusion into the bloodstream. It's totally harmless of these little gas microbubbles. And the nice thing about these microbubbles is that they have better reflection of the ultrasound wave. That's why they're called contrast agents, because basically they're used to improve contrast. They're not used for resolution. But once they're going through the blood, we could think of them just the same as in fluorophores and use them to actually increase resolution. So this leads to the method similar to, to Sparkum, but doing it for ultrasound. And in this context, uh, my students call this method sushi. So sparsity-based ultrasound, super resolution, hemodynamic imaging. And the first time I actually introduced this at an ultrasound conference, someone said that it's a very fishy method. Um, but, it, but it is fishy because look, it gives you really, Amazing resolution. So this is what you would see in a Stanford ultrasound image. And this is what you see after you apply sushi. So it really gives you a uh, really good resolution. Uh, we can use this for, again, for super resolution in general, unfold it so that we don't have to know anything about the system together with deep learning. And again, it gives very, very good resolution in practice. So after we got these first results and we're kind of excited about them, we did a clinical trial at Baylingson Hospital together with our collaborators, uh, Dr. Hoover Grubstein, who's the head of the imaging in Bellington Hospital. And what we, what we did in this uh, clinical trial was to look at patients with breast cancer. Now, if you look today at, at lesions in ultrasound, uh, basically you see these black holes, okay? So here's one example, here's another example. So these tumors are very different, but they both just look like black holes, okay? Which is one of the reasons that ultrasound is not used for detecting um, breast cancer. But if you apply the methods that we said right now, which is this deep unfolding approach, and if you look now, this is after deep unfolding. So if you look at this versus this, then you see that the tumors actually look very different because you could see the vasculature. And from the clinical point of view, the doctors could identify immediately that you know this was a free proteinoma. So this was a, a benign tumor. And this unfortunately, oh, sorry, I went the wrong way. And the other one, unfortunately, was a malignant tumor. And again, they could tell that by looking at the blood vessels. So this could take a, a simple machine like ultrasound and make it very effective. Okay, so that was a little bit on applications of unfolding. Another recent work that we did together with the group of uh, Professor Miguel Rodriguez at, at um, UCL was to look at whether we could get robust networks, again, from an optimization perspective. And the idea was to just use a robust version of the underlying optimization method. So. There's a lot of work on robust optimization. You could start with any optimization algorithm and robustify it. And then the question was, okay, so if I unfold a robust optimization problem rather than the original optimization problem, will I get a network that is more robust? Where here, mo more robust means settings where the underlying, let's say PSF actually changes. So you train for PSF one, but in practice you have PSF two. So of course the answer is yes. So for example, we looked at the, L1 recovery method, but now we used a robust version of it and we unfold it just like before. When you actually do the unfolding, you see that you get two additional terms that we didn't have before in, in, in Lista. So we get a normalization term that comes from the robust penalty and we get another term. Again, this is additional information from robustifying the problem. And then when we unfold it and compare the performance with Lista, we see that we get much better performance when we add error to the underlying PSF, okay? So we could get robust methods or robust networks by looking at robust optimization. All right, so that kind of sums up what I wanted to say about unfolding. I'll take, you know, a few more minutes just to show about how we use these methods for communications. But again, before changing gears to communications, I'll stop to see if there's any questions. Okay, I hope that's because everything is clear and not because nothing is clear. Um, okay, good. So I just want to thank you know, just we'll end by a few minutes talking about uh, deep symbol detection, meaning how we can use these plug-in approaches 
for communication networks. So in everything I've shown before, we've relied more on the unfolding. And in communication, we actually rely more on the plug-in approaches. And that's because there's many known really good heuristics in communication. So many of the methods are not really directly solving an optimization problem. Rather, they're, they're good heuristics that were developed over time. And what we want to do is exploit that, right? We want to use what people already know that works rather than replacing everything with a deep network. We want to take, you know, knowledge that has been accumulated over many, many years, and it's, it's all incorporated into our devices so we know it's good, and see, could we take what's already there, but add something to it to allow it to adapt to changing environments? Okay, so that's, that's basically the idea. Like I said before, you know, we want to empower model-based methods. We don't want to replace them. And this, of course, gives us many advantages and complexity, performance, stability, et cetera. And we've looked at this for many different examples, so I'm not going to show all of them here. The Turbinet we're going to show, Kalmanet I'm not going to show, but we could do everything I showed with the Viturbinet. We could do for Kalmanet, which basically takes the Kalman algorithm and does the same thing. And, of course, we could do this for many other problems as well. So let's go back to, to symbol detection and see how we can use this idea to get a robust symbol detector. So what's, what's common in the literature, what's done today, is that you know, when you don't know the channel conditions, you just replace everything with a deep network. So basically, you send symbols over the channel. You're going to get some output. You don't know really the channel. You don't model it. You take the output. You put it through your favorite um, deep network. And in that way, you recover the underlying symbols. OK, so one of the earlier examples that looked at this is a paper by uh, Andrea Goldsmith's group in 2018. And I think this was kind of the first extensive study um, to apply these methods to um, symbol detection. So I won't go exactly into what they did, but basically they used you know, a version of a deep network, of a standard deep network. They use a lot of training data. So they use 300 case sequences. OK, that's a huge amount of training data in order to train the network. And as we're going to see later on, it's very non-robust. So as soon as the parameters change, even just a little bit, it actually ends up not performing so well in, in practice. So the problem is that, again, there's many, many parameters. Therefore, you need large training sets. It's non-interpretable. And when the parameters change, the method doesn't work so well. On the other hand, it doesn't require, doesn't require knowing the model or knowing the channel. And you can use it in very complex environments. So what we want to do instead is use something that's more um, communication driven, but allows us to adapt to unknown channels. So what we're going to do is just the general um, recipe that we gave before. We're going to start with the method itself, look at what steps are model-based, and only replace those model-based steps. And we're going to do that, for example, for the Viterbi algorithm. So like we already said, the Viterbi algorithm basically solves a maximum likelihood problem over finite memory channels. Very famous, very well known, um, made Viterbi very rich, okay, the basis for the Qualcomm um, company. Here he's getting the medal of, I think, science or, or anyways, one of, one of the medals from the then president of, uh, uh, of the United States. So, you know, very useful algorithm incorporated in, in all of our phones. Um, but, of course, it requires knowledge of the underlying channel, which once wasn't a problem. Okay, you send a header, you estimate the channel, you plug it in. But again, if we think of very dynamic settings, IoT, et cetera, then that's not going to be so practical. So what we propose to do instead is to actually look closely at the Viterbi algorithm. And if you look at it closely, what it consists of is computing the likelihood of different symbols and then putting that into this trellis computation, which is basically dynamic programming over the, the channel. Now, if you think about it this way, only the likelihood depends on the channel. The trellis computation or the dynamic programming does not. So instead of replacing everything with a deep network, the only thing we need a deep network for is the likelihood computation. So what we do is the Viterbi net has the same structure as the Viterbi decoder, we just learn the likelihood from data, and likelihood is something very easy to learn from data. So we do that with a shallow two-layer network, and it gives really good performance. So what you see in the graph over here is that we approach the same performance you would get from Viterbi with the unknown channel. So even though I don't know the channel, I'm getting the same performance I would have gotten from Viterbi with the correct unknown channel. Okay, so we're doing really well um, in practice. We could use the same method for many other approaches. So any factor graph method, so many methods in communication are based on um, factor graphs where basically you decompose the probability into elements with finite uh, memory. 
And here again, instead of replacing such channels with end-to-end -end learning, we only have to learn the factor graph themselves. And in this way, we could do, for example, um, a deep network version of the famous VCGR algorithm. Um, so this is what we call VCGR net. And again, it works very well in practice. We could do this for interference cancellation. So that's another very popular method in communication where we just cancel the interferers one by one, right? We find the strongest interferer. This is for uh, multi-user channels. We eliminate it, we move on to the next interferer. So again, in all of these examples, what people do today is they just replace everything with a deep network. What we, we're saying instead is keep the structure of the algorithm, just learn what you don't know. So here in particular, what we won't know is let's say who's the strongest user. So we learn just that, but then once we find that strongest user, we eliminate it the same way that you would have before. So we keep the sequential method, but just learn um, the strongest user or the probability for the strongest user. So there's many more examples. I won't uh, bore you with them. Hopefully you get the main idea. And basically what we've tried to show here is that, you know, these are some methods. I'm sure there's, there's better ones that maybe some of you will think of. But the point is that we really want to bridge deep networks with signal processing or communications, not replace anyone um, by the other. And here we've shown some methods of how we could merge the two. The nice thing is that allows us to get very good performance with very small um, training sets. It's, it's very generic. Like you see, we've applied it to many, many different types of problems. Um, it preserves optimality when things are known, which is also um, very nice. And maybe the last bullet is really important. We see very good performance in practice, but it's kind of hard to prove it. This is true for all deep networks um, here as well. There's, there's some beginning of proofs that we've worked on. There's of course, many others that are working on, Professor Lee Sung um, has been working on theoretical analysis as well, and we're collaborating a little bit on that. So there's many, many interesting um, opportunities here on the practical side, but also on the theoretical side um, as well. So those of you interested in more detail, we have a recent review that we wrote about all of these approaches called model basic learning. And of course, none of this would have been possible without my amazing students that I've been uh, working with, and of course, my amazing collaborators who have contributed to this work. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'm really happy to take questions. Any questions? Like, I have a question. So like, uh, you were showing that it is like, in, um, when it was used on uh, microscopic images, it was getting the lines really well, right? The details. Is it possible to use it for denoising, for example, ultrasound, ultrasound images? Yeah, so we do, we don't, we don't consider it so much denoising in ultrasound. That's more like the beam forming. So, I mean, you could think of it as denoising. I think it's, it's kind of more just terminology, but in ultrasound, people don't really call it denoising because it's not really clear what's noise and what's not noise. They call it more beam forming because it's like you want to accumulate the data to a certain direction, but essentially it's, it's the same. So we do use it. The, the results I've shown for ultrasound, I can flip back to them for a minute, are you could think of that as denoising in a sense. Um, it, it's just, we call it here beamforming, but it's it's basically the same. Um, let me just flip back to that for a minute. Yeah, so if you look at this, for example, right? So, so you could think of this as like a denoised version of this. Really, it's it's a different form of beam forming, but at the end, it's all processing on the data. So maybe that's what you meant. That's what we use it for anyway. But you could use, I mean, you know, we have generic deep learning methods. You could plug anything in there. It could be an ultrasound image. Any other so when you do this uh, controlling, like does it reduce the Number of layers, deep network. So let's say we don't have control, we just directly use the deep network. Yeah, we use like all of the examples here are like 10 layers. Yeah, so we use a small number of layers, therefore, we also have a small number of parameters. So, which means the original optimization algorithm was able to run in 10 iterations? No, that's the beauty of it. So, the, the generic iteration, iterative algorithm usually needs thousands of iterations. Yeah. But here, I'm still learning, right? Like, I still have the power of training data that I'm learning from. So even, even with only 10 layers, we could get really good performance. And that's what, like, originally in, in Gregor and McLuhan's original paper, they weren't really thinking of learning. They were thinking more of optimization, like trying to minimize the number of iterative steps by doing that. 
but we can also use it for learning. So any other questions? Okay. Um, can we just, so let's say we have a deep network and we are trying to learn this deep network. That itself can be poses an optimization problem. So let's say we are using gradient descent to learn the deep network. Okay. Can we unroll that optimization problem? So you can if you add structure. Like the whole point of unrolling is that I have to have some to unroll, I have to have some structure that I'm incorporating. Otherwise, there's nothing to unroll, right? So like the unrolling, there's some underlying function that's assumed, and that's basically dictating the, arc, the, the structure of each iteration. So you could, but, but you have to add something, right? Otherwise, it's just going to go back to something generic. Are there any questions about online audience? So, for example, let's say the world like unfolding the network, some set of receiver and transmitters, and if we force for them, but if we send some introduce new set of transmitters and receivers, will it work? Will it give results for this? Uh, was it sent like uh, without uh, without training? Right. So that's the robustness issue, right? And that's true in any um, in any network. So of course, if you totally move to a different environment, then you're going to have to retrain. The the point is that training is easy, so retraining is not going to be complicated. If you only move a little bit, so that the parameters of the true channel are close enough to the parameters of the underlying channel, then it does actually work quite well, and that's the robustness issue. Okay, so there's robustness and generalization. Um, and, and again, I mean, that's true in any method, right? Like if I totally change the underlying PSF, then what I did before is not going to be relevant. If I change it a little bit, I still want it to be relevant. But if the training is simple, then even if I have to change everything, it's not going to be a big deal. Okay, so here. Uh, so I just want to get some clarification on something you said a few minutes ago. So when you unroll the steps of so my so algorithm. This suggests, for example, if you have 10 layers. So does it mean that each of these unrolled layers is basically doing the same operation just with different parameters? Yes, but different parameters already make it different. So it's doing the same operation with different parameters, but different parameters you know, add. Okay. Yeah. All right, thanks. That's that's what I wanted to Yeah. Do. Yes. Thanks, Bob. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Oh, maybe if there's questions online. Are there any questions from the online audience? Yeah, there's a question here. I mean, a comment. Hi. So, so this is Merwan. Yonina, I didn't even know. Hi, you great to see you. Great to see you. Well, I, I thought everything was online. Otherwise, I mean, we're just on the next part of the streets. Uh, otherwise, I would have come to see you. Uh, I was not aware that you were oh. coming. <laughs> yeah. Welcome, welcome uh, to Abu Dhabi. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so I, I just want to. So, thank you for your talk. I mean, uh, as you said, I mean, uh, where you showed communication, I would say systems, and and we have a legacy, uh, and communication networks worked, and this is why I think your approach is very nice because. Uh, we should take more of the gray gray box rather than the black box because we have how to incorporate some models and they worked an improvement. My question is that you looked at deep neural networks, but uh, a lot of also uh, learning machine learning algorithms use control stuff because you know mm -hmm. like reinforcement learning. And what do you think also about the merger of of machine learning today with control theory trying to improve things? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. So thanks for that. So we've started, I mean, first of all, for sure, that's a really important direction. We've started by looking at the Kalman net, which I didn't present here. I just don't want to bore people with so many examples, but we did learn basically what we did for Viterbi net. We also did for Kalman, which is, you know, I guess a starting point for control. So making, you know, a learned version of Kalman and that's what we call Kalman net. So we've looked at that, but I do, you know, our plan is to expand that further going into reinforcement learning. The way reinforcement learning is today is still, it's very black box, right? So we kind of want to build off, you know, start with column line, build up from there and try to get all the way to reinforcement learning, but in a more interpretable approach. So definitely that's kind of in our in our roadmap, but we're not there yet. Basically what we did so far is, is just the column in it, which is still, 
you know, not all the way full blown reinforcement learning, but, but definitely an important direction. And, you know, if this is something you're interested in, I'd be super happy to talk more about that because, you know, we're not doing that. I would say we're, we're, we're taking the first steps in that direction, but definitely that's the next thing to look at. Okay, good. Yeah, well, definitely. That would be good. I'll, I'll ping you with an email. Thank you for your talk. I've been trying, as you know, for many years to collaborate. So that would be wonderful to have a, an excuse to work together. So <laughs> thank you. Take care. Sure, same here. Father, any other questions? Uh, let's thank the speaker again. Thank okay, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you.